So, well, uh, how, how embarrassing. See, the, you, you shouldn't give introduction like that because there's no way the speaker lives up to the, to the hype. So just ramp your expectation down a little bit, please. Uh, it's so, uh, I'm so glad to be at the Acton Institute here. Uh, I, I, I've benefited greatly from the work at, on the moral foundations of, of a free economy and this whole topic that's really turned into a big field of faith work and economics just the pivotal work that's coming out of this place um, they are doing as many of you know the set of primers looking at those issues faith work and economics from different theological perspectives uh, again there's one from the Wesleyan one from the Reformed one from the Baptist, one from the Pentecostal. Uh, I was asked to do the one for, uh, for, for Lutheranism. Um, yeah, I, the, the plan was to have it uh, ready so it would be here for this, uh, for this lecture. Uh, but I was late. I actually turned it in on uh, Monday. And I realize that my problem is that I'm insufficiently endowed with the Protestant work ethic. So uh, missing my deadline. So I, I apologize for that. Um, but it, it's, I've done a lot of work on this concept of, of the doctrine of vocation. I've written a book about it called God at Work. That is, is back there. Um, because Lutherans have a lot to say about this kind of new issue for us, uh, or for, for most of us, faith, what's the connection between faith and work? Uh, this has been a preoccupation of, of Lutheran theologians for centuries. And uh, I would just commend that tradition to you, even if you're not, not Lutheran. Um, those of you who are Catholic or Orthodox will really appreciate the, the, the sacramental view of, of work that Lutheran theology really puts forward. It's really not, not, not less than that. Um, uh, those of you who are of the Reformed tradition, Luther does so much with the concept of, of God's providence and sovereignty and how he's working in the ordinary facets of everyday labor uh, and evangelicals of all kinds uh, whether you're reformed or, 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 or Baptist or many or whatever I think would really appreciate how Lutheran theology relates vocation in our daily work our daily labor to the gospel and to faith and how it shows work growing out of faith in Christ. Uh, this is not known very, very much, especially in the English-speaking world. Um, so it, it, it's, 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 it's new. It's not exactly the same as, as, as Calvin's work on vocation, which he carried this. Uh, he, he had some very helpful developments of, of the teaching of vocation and it's based on this foundation but, but it's different it's kind of different and so I just commend uh, you uh, any of you in, interested in the, the the faith and work uh, movement to, to uh, see what, see what Luther uh, and, and Lutheran theologians have to say about it so as I was working on this uh, project my task that I set myself was to relate the doctrine of vocation, which again I've been doing quite a lot with, to economics, specifically to free market economics. As I was doing that, I realized, of course, that I was not the first to take on that task. That in fact, there's a very important work that was seminal, not just in that field, but in starting the whole discipline of the social sciences, you can almost say, and that is uh, Max Weber's uh, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Because he's relating, he showed just historically how this concept of vocation, 
that came about at the Reformation had a huge impact on the, the new eco economics, that really the beginning of the modern, modern economy. The, the, the problem though, especially as I, as I studied Weber some more, is that he got it all wrong. Well, not all, but he got the part about vocation wrong. A, a complete misunderstanding of vocation which prevents the real, in, not only the in influence as a, as a historical matter, but what vocation brings to the issue of faith, work, and economics. He, he, he kind of excises the, the moral foundation and the moral teaching of vocation and turns it into something very different. So what I want to do today is talk about that, talk a little bit about Weber's thesis and, and where, where he's, where he's uh, falls short, my view. And then I want to briefly unpack the Lutheran teaching about vocation and then briefly apply it to free market economics, which is <coughs> interest of the Acton Institute. And again, I'm going to do this very briefly. I'll do it less briefly in that uh, little book when it comes out, uh, now that I finally have it turned in. So, uh, yeah, why did free market capitalism have its beginnings and first flourishing in Protestant nations, England, the Netherlands, Germany, Scandinavia, and North America, and it was so late in coming to Catholic nations, France, Italy, Spain, and South America. That was the research question posed by Max Weber in his pioneering study, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, uh, first published in 1905. Weber found that the Protestant Reformation gave a specific spiritual significance to human labor and to economic activity. Luther's doctrine of vocation taught that the Christian life is to be lived out in the world as opposed to the monastic ideal of separation from the world and that the ordinary occupations by which people earn their living and function in their communities are callings from God himself. Uh, this theology, Weber said, led to a Protestant work ethic that manifested itself in the creation of wealth, social mobility, and the elements of capitalism. Weber found in early Protestantism other cultural and psychological factors that contributed to the rise of capitalism. For example, the early Protestants tended to dislike ostentation. When an Italian merchant accumulated wealth, according to Weber, he tended to immediately build himself a palace. When a Puritan merchant accumulated wealth, he continued to live in a modest home. Well, the nouveau riche in Catholic countries sought social status by trying to emulate the medieval lords. The newly affluent Puritan would be embarrassed to flaunt his wealth by spending it on himself. So instead, he would save it. His wealth would accumulate. At some point, he would invest that money, either in plowing it back into his own business or in investing it in completely new ventures. To facilitate the saving, accumulation, and investing of wealth, modern banking was invented. Thus, wealth transformed into capital. Weber's book is filled with these kind of penetrating observations. But what was the theological connection between the Reformation and the economic growth that accompanied it? What did Reformation spirituality, that is the inner personal religious life of devout believers, have to do with economics? When Weber tries to address these questions, he stumbles. Weber reduces Reformation theology and spirituality to predestination. He reasons that since salvation for the uh, Reformation believers is no longer seen as a matter of good works, but depends sheerly on God's grace, 
Protestant believers could never know for certain if God had elected them or not. This uncertainty, Weber said, must have created a terrible psychological burden. Individuals would thus have a tendency to seek evidence of God's favor. This would include, among other things, the way God blessed them in their vocations. Thus, economic success would be interpreted as evidence of salvation, giving troubled Christians a great incentive to work hard to achieve it. But here, Weber is indulging in psychological speculation, saying that the Reformation believers must have uh, felt this way due the, to the alleged mental pressure of predestination. The, the problem is that this theological reductionism c contradicts everything the Reformation stood for. What began as the rejection of salvation by moral works is turned back by Weber into salvation by economic works. Furthermore, the Reformation was not particularly characterized by a feeling of uncertainty regarding salvation. The Reformers taught the assurance of salvation that comes from faith in the gospel of Christ, or Luther, the total security of the believer that comes from God's grace, uh, for Calvin, and yet, Luther, and yet Weber turns the essence of Protestantism into the lack of assurance and total insecurity. Moreover, early Protestants, whether theologians or parish preachers, never taught that wealth is an evidence of salvation. And I can't find any evidence of lay people, wealthy or not, thinking along those lines. Uh, I mean, would it ever occur to you, let's see, here we are in, in Grand Rapids, the Calvinist Vatican. If you feel uncertain about your salvation, do you look at your bank account? Did any of you actually do that? Well, if not here in, in Grand Rapids, where, where would it be? I mean, there are, uh, you know, to look at, you know, if you're uncertain, turn to prayer, take the sacraments. Calvin does talk about looking at your, at your works. But again, those weren't, um, especially how successful your business is, I don't believe. Uh, now, you will hear people, and we all talk about this too, say, yes, I'm, I'm, I've been successful, God has really blessed me, but again, but, and, which is true, but we're not talking about that that's a sign of election, I don't think. Um, Weber quotes Puritans, such as Richard Baxter, on the importance of hard work and the godlessness of idleness. But those Puritans don't draw the conclusions that Weber extrapolates from their teachings. Also, as Weber's critics have shown, when the theologians and the preachers do address issues of wealth and economic success, they warn of the spiritual dangers of trusting in mammon. And they exhort the wealthy to use their abundance in generosity to the poor and in service to their neighbors. Indeed, the early capitalists were, in fact, noted for their acts of benevolence and philanthropy. Now, Weber is observing some significant facts and making some important connections, but he failed to understand the people he was writing about. And as a modern materialist agnostic, he could not enter into his subject's theological convictions and their spiritual life. Now, Weber's methodological problem was that he skipped Luther and went straight to later Calvinists and to the Puritans for his understanding of vocation. He did credit Luther for the concept, but he had not studied Luther's own writings on the subject and the way they were applied by Lutheran lay people. He thus missed Luther's great spiritual insight that God himself works through human vocations to care for his creation. He also missed Luther's ethical insight that the purpose of every vocation is to love and serve one's neighbor. For Luther and the Lutherans, work is to be pursued as an act of love. The whole economic order becomes a network of God's providential action as human beings, whether believers or non-believers, in every facet of the division of labor 
They're loving and serving each other, meeting each other's needs, forming an interdependence that manifests itself in multiple levels of communities. Uh, Luther's doctrine of vocation uh, was embraced by the other Protestants, including Calvin. And, and Calvin's writings on the subject sound very much like Luther. And he, he carried them into some different areas. He, he adapted it more to the new economy that was emerging, whereas Luther was still working with kind of the late medieval economy. And there were some differences and nuances. But you really need to start at the beginning, I think, to understand the, the, the essence of, of what vocation was all about and the way it was, it was seen and felt and carried out by the, by the people who, who put it into practice. And again, Luther didn't make this up. Uh, he certainly insisted that his teachings are drawn from the Bible. And he has some fascinating biblical exegesis for this theology of vocation. Um, and it predated Luther, many of the elements that he pulled together. Uh, one, another criticism of Weber is that some of the elements of capitalism that he emphasizes can also be found in late medieval pre-Reformation writings and practices. Monasteries, too, were places of self-denial that often accumulated great wealth without ostentatiously spending it all on themselves. They accumulated great wealth, which in turn was transformed into capital. Luther was a late medieval thinker, as well as arguably one of the first modern thinkers. And we can see elements of his doctrine of vocation in late medieval sources. Uh, most notably, uh, I talk about in the, in the book, in that little book, uh, William Langlan, uh, also in the Benedictine tradition of ora et labora, to pray and to work as monastic discipline. One of the things Luther's uh, doctrine of vocation did uh, was to apply the spiritual disciplines of the monastery and, and to bring them out into the lives of laity as well. To be sure, the spiritual and ethical significance of human labor and of economic activity, an insight that was of central importance for the early Protestant, would fade in time. Many churches, though not all, stopped teaching it. Meanwhile, as the late medieval economy changed in what we recognize as modern capitalism, especially after the Industrial Revolution, the emphasis in economic thought shifted from the neighbor to the self. Whereas Luther's doctrine of vocation was oriented to building community, people began thinking of the economic system the vocation helped to build in terms of isolated, autonomous individuals. Whereas Luther saw in the economic order the providential workings of a loving God, the Enlightenment, brought forward a way to imagine God as someone far above the universe, looking down, the watchmaker God. and th th That's carried over even in Christian writers. It's not just deism, but, and even today, we often think of God as someone far away rather than someone in whom we live and move and have our being. And certainly the world itself began to be seen in terms of impersonal material forces. And that culminated, of course, in Adam Smith's analysis of the economic order in terms of countless individuals all pursuing their, their rational self-interest. And yet Luther may well have agreed with much of Smith's analysis. Luther often showed how God drives even wicked sinners into performing his will. Thus a selfish, greedy business owner may be only interested in himself, carry nothing for his neighbor. Nevertheless, the way the economy works, if he does not produce something that serves his neighbor, offering something that the neighbor needs, the business will fail. Participants in the economy must serve their neighbors. And Christians, motivated by the love of Christ they've known in the gospel, can love their customers, employers, employees, and colleagues. Luther taught that God is hidden in vocation. He would surely like Smith's concept of the invisible hand, so that the economic order functions for both sinners and saints. Now, the, the later re Reformed tradition, which is most familiar to the English-speaking world, 
tends to look at vocation, God's calling, in terms of his demands upon his followers, an application of the moral law. This is indeed part of it for Luther. But he first of all saw in vocation a manifestation not only of law, but of gospel. For Luther, vocation, like justification, is a function of God's grace. Furthermore, as in Luther's strong emphasis on the sacraments, God bestows his grace, his gifts, and his very presence through physical means. The waters of baptism, the bread and wine of Holy Communion, the paper, ink, and sound waves of his word, and through human beings working in their vocations. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, to use one of Luther's illustrations, we ask God to give us this day our daily bread. And he does. The way he gives us our daily bread is through the vocation of farmers, millers, and bakers. In our modern economy, we might add truck drivers, factory workers, bankers, warehouse attendants, and food service workers. Virtually every facet of our whole economic system contributed to that piece of toast we had for breakfast. And when we thank God for our food to eat, we, before we eat, we're right to do so. He does provide our food, and he does so by means of vocation. That is, by means of ordinary people just doing their jobs. To use another example from Luther, God could have chosen to create new human beings to populate the earth out of the dust as he did with the first man. But instead, he chose to create new life, which however commonplace is no less miraculous, by means of mothers and fathers, wives and husbands, the vocations of the family. To continue the point, God protects us through the vocations of earthly government, as detailed in Romans 13. He proclaims his word, and brings the forgiveness of sin by means of human pastors. He teaches by means of teachers. He creates works of beauty and meaning by means of human artists, all of whom he has given their particular talents. When someone is hospitalized, someone we care about is in the hospital, we pray for healing. God uses vocation doctors, nurses, anesthesiologists, other healthcare workers to deliver that healing. God's normal way of working in the world is through means. God does not have to use means, and he's capable of working immediately. He can heal with a miracle, just as he once provided the children of Israel their daily bread, the manna of the wilderness, without farmers and bakers. But God's normal, God's normal way of operating is through human beings. This is because he desires us to serve each other. According to Luther, vocation is a mask of God. A mask of God. God milks the cows through the vocation of the milkmaid, Luther said. God is hidden in vocation. We see the milkmaid, or the farmer, or the doctor, or the pastor, or the artist, but looming behind this human mask, God is genuinely present and active in what they do for us. And similarly, as we carry out our various vocations, we too are mass of God. Evangelicals often talk about what God is doing in their lives. Vocation encourages reflection also on what God is doing through our lives. Just as God is working through the vocation of others to bless us, he's working through us to bless others. In our vocations, we work side by side with God, as it were, taking part in his ceaseless creative activity and laboring with him as he providentially cares for his creation. And for Luther, vocation means much more than simply the way a person makes a living, though it includes that. Vocation, simply the Latinate word for calling. God calls us to different tasks different relationships in the course of our lives in the temporal world. Uh, key text, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 17. Let everyone live the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which he has called him. 
the idea that God assigns us areas of service. He assigns us a life, and then he calls us to that life. God's callings take specific forms in accord with how God creates and governs human societies. Luther taught that each Christian has multiple vocations, which in turn exist in four estates that God has established to order human life. The church, the household, the state, and what Luther called the common order of Christian love. The first calling or vocation that every Christian has is to the estate of the church. Every Christian has been called through the gospel into the life of faith, becoming a member of Christ's body, the church. In the words of Luther's small catechism, uh, here all the LCMS people can uh, uh, recite this. Uh, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Ghost has called me by the gospel. Even as he calls gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ and the one true faith in which Christian church he forgives daily and richly all sins to me and all believers. To be sure, God works providentially through the labors of non-believers as well as believers. Was the farmer who grew the grain for our daily bread, the police officer who kept us from getting robbed a Christian, Strictly speaking, as far as God's working through human beings, it doesn't matter. And there's no external difference in the work done by a Christian farmer or Christian police officer and a non-Christian farmer or police officer. The difference is that for a Christian, the work can be done in faith, while the non-believer does the same work, but for different motives. Uh, the state of the church involves a personal calling to the gospel, but also since God tends to call individual human beings in the communities, he also calls people to task and offices in his church. Pastors speak rightly of being called into the ministry, whereupon God works through them to teach his word, distribute his sacraments, and give spiritual care to his people. Church workers, pastors, teachers, missionaries, and the like do have a special vocation through whom God brings his people into a spiritual kingdom and brings them to everlasting life. Lay like people, too, are part of this community of faith and can help each other in their spiritual lives. Uh, those who are not called to full-time church work may not have an office in the church, but they are also can be called to do the little task in a local congregation, singing in the choir, serving on committees, serving meals, and other ways blessing their fellow members. Luther's second estate is the household. For Luther, the estate of the household includes both the family and the activities by which the family supports itself. He had in mind the concept expressed in the Greek word oikonomia, the laws of the household. This is a source of the English word economy. For Luther, in his day of family-based labor, economic life is connected with family life. Since then, family life and economic life have been split into two realms. Today, they're often in conflict with each other. But Luther and the early reformers uh, relate economic activity to the family, but it's still significant as modern Christians struggle to order their lives. Um, today, we think of vocation primarily in terms of economic activity, but much of Luther's writing on vocation has to do with vocation to the family. Uh, God established marriage and being a husband or a wife is a vocation, a calling. Being a father or a mother is also a vocation. So is being a son or daughter. That's a calling. That's your vocation. Is there being a brother or sister, nephew or uncle, grandmother, grandfather? One person holds multiple vocations within a family. A woman may be the wife of her husband, the mother of her children, the daughter of her mother, the sister of her brother, and more, with each vocation having its particular dimensions of service. Luther's third estate is the state. This includes earthly government, but it's more than that. We might say society, or better yet, because the more particular, the, the culture or the community. This estate involves the many social networks that we're part of. 
if the household includes a particular economic labor that an individual pursues, as in microeconomics, the state includes the larger economic interrelationships, as in macroeconomics. Thus, Luther sometimes discusses particular economic vocations in this category as well. At any rate, we were each born into a particular time, place, and society. The cultural context in which we find ourselves is thus part of the life that God has assigned us. 1 Corinthians 7. We thus have responsibilities to our government, to our culture, to our local communities. Some Christians are called to position of authority in the government as presidents, legislators, judges, police officers. Americans have the unusual calling of being both subjects and rulers at the same time. It's our democratic republic places the governing authorities themselves under the authority of the people who elect them. Christians thus have the vocation of citizenship, which means that politics, civic involvement, cultural engagement are all valid realms of Christian service. And just, just apply, just see how vocation really solves a lot of the, the cultural conflicts that a lot of modern Christians are, uh, are, are, are very confused about and struggling with. Our formal positions in the family, the workplace, the church, and the culture are not the only spheres of service to which God assigns us and to which he calls us. Journalists like to refer to their profession as the fourth estate. But Luther's fourth estate is what he called the common order of Christian love. This is the realm where people of different vocations interact informally. In Christ's parable of the Good Samaritan, the priest and the Levite were on the way to serve in their vocations, but ignored the man bleeding by the side of the road. In the ordinary course of everyday life and in our relationships with friends and neighbors and even with our enemies and strangers, God also works and calls us to serve us. For Luther, vocation is nothing less than the locus of the Christian life. God works in and through vocation, but he does so by calling human beings to work in their vocations. In his incarnation in Jesus Christ, who bore our sins and gives us new life in his resurrection, God saves us for eternal life. In the meantime, he places us in our temporal life, where we grow in faith and holiness. In our various callings, spouse, parent, church member, citizen, and worker, we are to live out our faith. Which doesn't mean to live out our faith in our callings. The Bible is clear. Faith bears fruit in love. Galatians 5, 6, 1 Timothy 1, 5. Here we come to the relationship between justification by faith and good works, and to the ethical implications of vocation. According to Luther's doctrine of vocation, the purpose of every vocation is to love and serve our neighbors. God does not need our good works, Luther said, but our neighbor does. A relationship with God is placed completely on his work for us in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Justification by faith completely excludes any kind of dependence on our good works for our salvation. We come before God clothed not in our own works or merits, but solely in the works and merits of Christ. But having been justified by faith, we are sent by God back into the world, back into our vocations to love and serve our neighbors. Though we may speak of serving God in our vocation, strictly speaking, we do not serve God. He always serves us. Rather, we are to serve our neighbors, the actual human beings whom God brings into our lives as we carry out our daily callings. Thus, every vocation has a particular neighbors. Uh, it's good to keep asking that question uh, of, the, of the lawyer uh, in Luke 10. Who is my neighbor? Well, again, with the Good Samaritan, the person bleeding by the side of the road. In the church, pastors are to love and serve their congregations. They're to love and serve him and each other. Uh, in, in marriage, you only have one neighbor. It makes it easy. Uh, husbands are to love and serve their wives. Wives are to love and serve their husbands. They both love and serve each other, putting the other first, denying their own needs. 
uh, and vocation of parenthood, the neighbor is your child. Loving and serving your kids sums up what parenting is all about, right? Uh, feeding them, clothing them, educating them, driving them places. That's parenting. For the child, your, your neighbor in that relationship is your parents, as well as your brothers and sisters. In the vocation of the state, those with law, vocation of lawful authority are to love and serve the people under their authority. They do so by protecting them from evildoers, enforcing justice, respecting their liberties so that they can lead a peaceful and quiet life. There's no vocation, when sometimes a, a, a ruler might not love and serve their subjects, demand that they're serving him, and, but there's no calling to be a tyrant. Uh, every calling is to be expressed in love and service to those, even with authorities under your care. Now, the economic vocations give us many neighbors whom we are to love and serve. Customers, also bosses, subordinates, co-workers, suppliers, competitors. But serving others in the workplace is not just an ethical injunction for individuals, it describes the workings of the economy as a whole. In the economic vocations, workers of every kind are to carry out their labors in love and service to their, to their customers. And again, if, you're, if a business doesn't do that, doesn't at least serve others, provide goods or services that people need, or that you know, doesn't help them in any way, it, it, it'll go out of business. Now, and yet did the farmer who grew the grain that went into a daily piece of toast this morning actually love me? Probably not. He doesn't even know me. He planted and harvested his grain in order to make a living for himself and his family. He's dependent on multiple factors. Nature, the weather, the global supply, the commodities future market, government agricultural policies, and, and so on, which determine the price he gets from a bushel of wheat and whether or not he can turn a profit. The farmer, along with the food processors, bakers in the bread factory, manager of the grocery store that sold me the bread, they're all motivated by economic self-interest. And, and that's true. Free market economists, beginning with Adam Smith, have shown how the economic order is a complex network of individuals pursuing their enlightened self-interest. So self-interest is surely the opposite of love, of neighbor, just as selfishness is the opposite of love. It would thus seem that Luther's doctrine of vocation, which teaches that the purpose of all human callings is to deny oneself in order to love and serve others, is incompatible with at least contemporary free market economics. But there are two other elements of Luther's thought that can bring a different conclusion. The bondage of the will and the action of God. For Luther, sin is an inescapable part of the human condition. When he refers to the bondage of the will, he means not some divine determinism, but the human beings are in bondage to sin, that the fallen will itself is incapacitated so that we don't usually choose what's good and that we, ought, we or tend to choose what's bad. Luther goes on to describe that fallen condition as incurvatus in se, the state of being curved in upon oneself. Curved in upon oneself. He treats this concept in depth in his lectures on Romans. Here's a quote from Luther. Human nature knows nothing but its own good, or what is good and honorable and useful for itself, but not what is good for God and other people. Therefore it knows and wills more what is particular, yes, only what is an individual good. And this is in agreement with Scripture, which describes man as so turned in on himself that he uses not only physical but even spiritual goods for his own purposes and in all things seeks only himself. This curvedness is now natural for us, a natural wickedness and a natural sinfulness. 
Thus man has no help from his natural powers, but he needs the aid of some power outside of himself. This is love. This is love. Human beings, by their fallen nature, are, are oriented first and foremost to themselves. They're curved in upon themselves. And moreover, they, I'm saying they, I, we should say we, I suppose, they strive to be in all other good things, including not only physical, but even spiritual goods, so as to gratify the self. But they, we also experience love, which takes us outside of ourselves. Love draws us to other human beings, to the external world, to God. And, it says in 1 John 4, 7, all love is from God. That love, the love we experience in our work is, is the effect of God who is hidden in our callings and who actively works through us. Yes, in our economic activities, we're working for our self-interest. But we're not just doing it for benevolent reasons. We, we, want, we want money for, our, for the work we give. But if we're honest and attentive to our deepest motivations, we have to recognize that we're also working for love. We work as hard as we do, taking on unpleasant tasks and pushing ourselves to the point of exhaustion sometimes because we love our families and we're trying to provide for. We often love the people we work with. And so take on responsibilities in the workplace that go beyond just our selfish aggrandizement. We might feel a love for our customers and want to give them our best. And there's also love for the work itself, the satisfaction that comes from exercising our skills, from making something, from having an effect on the world outside ourselves. All of these examples of love manifest themselves in acts of self-sacrifice, of saying no to what we might want to do at the time, they know out of love. And ultimately, again, all these loves come from God and are the sign of his presence. Certainly the iron laws of economics keep grinding on, with all the players following their rational self-interest and the vast interplay of supply and demand, wages and productivity. But even while the players are in one sense turned in upon themselves, they also in the work of their vocations are turned outward to others. That is, though they are motivated by self-interest, they are also motivated by love. More than that, the whole economic system, when it's working rightly, has the effect of love. The purpose of vocation again is to love and serve the neighbor, but even if we work only for our self-interest, the economy functions so that the neighbor is served. Self-interest demands that someone attend to the interests of others. And this brings us back to Luther's other key teaching about vocation. God himself acts through human vocation. He does so by employing sinners curved in upon themselves as instruments of his love. To be sure, human beings often resist God's love, tend to be fixated on loving and serving themselves rather than their, their neighbors. But they cannot thwart God's working and his purposes. Um, again, to be sure, we can sin in and against our vocations. The fallen world is rife with injustice, exploitation, and fraud. Luther is outspoken in denouncing sin in the workplace and in the economic order. I discuss that in that, in that book. But despite the distortions of sin, God in his providence, that is in the way that he provides for his creation, is present and active in vocation, and thus in the whole economic order, and the sign of his presence is love. Luther's emphasis on the neighbor and how God's love causes the neighbor to be served despite human sinfulness accords well with the invisible hand of the free market. And the supreme free market economist Friedrich Hayek also describes how self-interest serves the interests of the neighbor. And the words, here's Christopher Nagel's summary of what he was saying. Uh, for market competition leads a self-interested person to wake up in the morning, look outside at the earth, and produce from its raw materials not what he wants, but what others want. 
not in the quantities he prefers, but in quantities his neighbors prefer. Not at the price he dreams of charging, but at the price reflecting how much his neighbors value what he has done. But what we can most learn from Luther is how to carry out our economic vocations despite the iron laws of economics in personal terms. The great biographer of Luther, Roland Baton, observed, in the realm of economics, Luther considered less the abstract laws of supply and demand than the personal relations of buyer and seller, debtor and creditor. And this is what vocation teaches us. We work in our callings, doing what we have to do, selling our labor and our wares for what the market will bear, caught up in the demands and impersonal economic forces of our work, and yet in these very callings, we encounter other human beings. Our callings give us neighbors. We're put into relationship with them. They're not objects to be used or exploited or scammed. They're fellow human beings for whom Christ died. Thus our economic labors also have a personal dimension for ourselves and for others, which is the love and service of vocation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Veith. We do have, uh, we will finish at 1.15, so we have about 10 minutes, uh, to 10 to 12 minutes for some questions. So if you have a question, uh, just raise your hand, and uh, I'm sure Dr. Veith will have an answer. <laughs> or the small catechism will have an answer. Thank you, Dr. Veith. What's the theological issue, if you could articulate it, of those who hear what you say and accept it intellectually, but basically are lazy and will not work? What do you do with those? And of course, that leads to the social policy issues that we face on such a massive scale today. Right, well, I have a whole long section in this book that's coming out on sinning in vocation. And vocation is the realm of the Christian life. It's also the realm of, of sin because we don't want to serve our neighbors. We want them to serve us, maybe, but we're not always willing to, to, to work and to do what, what's needed. So that would be an example of that. Um, we sin in our vocation. We sin against our vocation uh, where you use the talents and abilities God gives you. For example, a doctor who becomes an abortionist, who uses those gifts not for the proper work to love and serve a neighbor, but, 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 but to kill the neighbors brought into us. So th th that's a whole, uh, th there's a whole issue. So there are people who, who don't want to serve others. You know, they're, they're lazy, that may be one reason, they're selfish or whatever. The thing, though, is that vocation keeps working whether anybody wants it to or not, in the sense of God's making things happen. So a person who who's, who's doesn't want to work, there are consequences of that. You know, if, if he won't work, let him not eat. Uh, <clears throat> there's that. But, but even there are other examples of it. The, the kind of alienation that brings from a community, the kind of isolation that brings. Now, there are a lot of people who, who want to work but aren't working. And the whole challenge of, of, of unemployment. Um, I say to people who are in that, in that state and, and who just, it, it hurts them more than, than just not even having the income. They're, they doubt their whole reason for living sometimes. I, I direct them to their other callings. Their real vocation, they still have the vocation in the church, in the family, in their citizenship, in the common order of Christian love. And I try to direct people in, into those areas and to see their value not and this isn't a problem, the opposite problem, people who see their, their value just in their work, then when it's taken care, away from them, they're, 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 they're almost lost, that their justification for their existence is not from their work, 
they're justified by Christ. It's Christ who gives them the approval. It's Christ who, who uh, forgives their sin. And it's Christ who can um, inspire them to more. So, um, again, this is a, a paradigm that, that I've given you that applies in so many rich and nuanced ways. And in some ways, I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure that would be a good discussion just to think through how it applies in, in a particular situation. Any other questions? I'm in the area of career selections. Excellent. Um, so yeah. is there anything that you could address regarding um, discerning? How do I discern where mm -hmm. I fit in yeah. the economy and the service of good. the economy and God? All right. It's a very good question. Thanks for letting me address that. Much of the career counseling that young people get today, college students I work with and uh, everyone, talks about choosing your vocation. And students will research, oh, what's a, what's a job that makes a lot of money? I want to do that. Uh, or where there'll be a chance for a job after, uh, uh, after college. But there's a difference between choosing an occupation and being called to it. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't choice involved, and you still have to, have to do that. But to be called to something depends on the gifts God has given you, the abilities you have, he's given, even the interests that a person has, and the opportunities that they have. These are all ways that God uses to bring people where, where he wants you. Um, I mean, the example, a uh, student who, uh, I want to be an accountant, accountant's Good job, make lots of money. There's going to be lots of openings in four years. I see this, so they become accountants, but they're terrible at math. <laughs> they flunk out of their, their, their accounting classes. Or they're good at math, but they hate their accounting classes. Probably not, God probably isn't calling into that area as much as they want to. Um, but calling is not self-chosen. Luther makes that point. That's a, it's not self-chosen. God brings us through just the ordinary processes of life. And it's still hard to find. And it's still discern, but you, it's the doors that open and the doors that slam in your face. And, um, and for students who, who fail out of a program, I, I tell them, you know, th th this, this, this is good. You needed that. Now God is, 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 is not calling you in that area, but he, he's going to call you in something else. So, but again, just how you think of it. Is this something God has called me to or something I just want to do because I want to do it for whatever reason? Yeah. I work with a group of um, prisoners, and mm. as I, I work with these men, the question becomes for me is, here's, here's a group of lives, and they're in a very secluded area. How can, and, and they do look for purpose in their life. Yeah. And these men happen to be Christians, and so my question is, how can I talk vocation to them in a way that is, very meaningful in yeah. the situation in which they're in. Yeah, boy, is there a calling to be a, a prisoner? Uh, I don't know, probably not. There's certainly God never calls anyone to sin, and, and he never calls anyone to do something that harms the neighbor rather than helps the neighbor. Um, but in their situation, this is where they've been assigned by God, working through Romans 13, and this is where they placed them. I would urge them maybe to think about in terms of their, of the neighbor. They have neighbors, their fellow prisoners. They have interactions with the guards and, and you and people who are trying to help them. Um, 
The prison is an arena for living out the Christian life, maybe in a very dramatic way. And again, we, we use vocation. It's become a synonym for profession or occupation, what we do to make a living. Like I say, that's part of it, but that's at, more, at most one-fourth of it. So um, I would encourage them to think about, uh, but they're in a community. They're in a community of, of people in, in, locked up in prison. And that's where they're to love and serve. You know, they have callings in the church, their relationship with other Christians, uh, relationship with their families. It's often so, such a strain in when somebody is, is incarcerated, both for the prisoner and the family behind. Um, as citizens, and coming to terms with how they need to live in, um, you know, when they, when they get out and reflect on their lives. No, I think this is a great way. People struggling with meaning, vocation is very helpful. But again, it doesn't have to be something that you're getting, not just what you're getting paid to do to make a living. That's not, the, 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 as go to the, to the heart and the meaning of vocation, the place that God assigned you to love and serve your neighbors. And I think even prisoners locked up will find that very helpful. I think. Yes. Yeah, I wonder if you could reflect on the difference between Luther's time and now, and specifically in this yeah. regard. Um, you know, Luther, as you've articulated very well, has a, a very comprehensive vision of vocation um, that includes the three estates and the, and the common order of love. He doesn't have a separate order or sphere or institution with respect to economics, even though there are economic aspects with regard to those mm -hmm. spheres. Whereas nowadays, if you were to ask many people what their vocation is, the first thing they would think of is what they get a paycheck to do. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the significance of that shift or, or what that well, might mean? Right. Well, 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 Luther does talk about what you get a paycheck to do, he, but he puts it in the estate with the family as, as how you, you know, live and provide for yourself. Uh, the very word economics means, comes from economia, the laws of the household. That, that may be an emphasis in economics that we might want to kind of return to, the connection of economics to the, the home. But you're right, they've been split apart. Uh, I think we can still talk about it in, 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 in the two different ways. Um, it's, you know, Karl Marx talks about the, the alienation of labor. Um, the, that when shoemakers who had a real skill making shoes, then when they were all put out work by the factory, and all, instead of using their skill, they, it's just pulling levers and churning out food. He talks about the alienation of, of, of labor. Uh, and again, we don't believe in Karl Marx here at the Acton Institute, of course. He may have had something about the, the loss, though, of that sense of vocation, uh, at least among common workers. And although, you know, the Industrial Revolution did improve the standard of living for everybody, it was a great thing. Um, I think that's one of the areas of vocation, again, talking about the modern economy versus Luther's economy. Uh, I think that's very valid. I have the sense that today's modern economy Actually, the doctrine of vocation is relevant in a, in, in a new, very urgent way that um, because we deal with these questions of meaning and priorities and what do I have, being pulled all these different directions, being busy in all these ways, the vocation can help us sort out a lot of that. And not just that, show us the, the value of what we're doing in our lives in this, in this society, in this economy. Uh, I can talk about that a little bit in the book. Um, but uh, Calvin, and I'll give him credit uh, here in Grand Rapids, uh, he showed how vocation can be applied really in the new economy. For example, Luther's would usually say, stay in your calling, stay in your vocation. If you're a peasant and you become a Christian, now his point was you don't have to go into the monastery 
to be a really strong Christian, you can stay where you are and be a really strong Christian. Okay, that, there was very little social mobility, very little um, um, ability of any kind. Now Calvin, with a new economy, he did encourage people making the point that vocations can change and that God can call somebody as different opportunities present themselves. And that, that was very helpful. Um, so Luther's ideas, I think, can be applied in different ways to different economies uh, or, or to different, in the different historical circumstances. I, I, I do think it's, it's relevant today. And, and these principles of loving your neighbor in your vocation in the way you earn a paycheck, among everything else, uh, is very profound. Um, and it, it's, it can be applied in a lot of different ways, a lot of different contexts. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Veith. Join me in thanking yeah. Dr. Veith. Thank you. We appreciate thank you. that. Thank you.